Okay, um, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for coming. I assume that people either uh, knew there would be snacks or um, or maybe you're required to be here for your class. Uh, either way, uh, obviously we've got a full full room, so thanks for, for joining. Um, as you said, I'm Paul Shoring. I'm a senior fellow and director of the Technology and National Security Program at an organization called the Center for New American Security, uh, or CNAS. We're a Washington, D.C.-based uh, think tank. It's a bipartisan organization. So we have both Democrats and Republicans on staff. So you get it right there, even in our logo, right, red and blue, uh, working together. And what I want to talk today about is a topic of my recent book uh, called Army of None, Autonomous Weapons in the Future of War. So I'm going to give kind of an overview of some of the technologies, how it's evolving, what we're seeing uh, militaries really around the globe invest in. And then I'll raise some of the legal and ethical and policy issues that come with this technology. So we are now uh, well into the military robotics revolution. We have seen uh, drones proliferate widely around the globe, uh, being used in current combat operations by a number of countries. There are over 90 countries that have uh, drones today, including many non-state groups. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, several dozen countries that have or are in the process of acquiring armed drones. So this is a map from the book showing armed drone proliferation. It's already a little bit uh, out of date. You would add today several more countries, particularly in uh, North Africa, um, that have now acquired armed drones. And you can see where these are coming from. The leading proliferator of armed drones internationally is China. Over 90% of all armed drone transfers around the globe come from China. Um, so this is not just uh, a technological evolution that's happening quickly, but it is very much a global one, one that is really outside of the scope of any one nation to control or influence. Now, as we see uh, the technology spreading around the globe, it's also developing and maturing in very significant ways. Uh, and that's what I'll be predominantly talking about. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is more autonomy in drones as they continue to develop technologically. Uh, this is the X-45A. Uh, it was, at the time, a cutting-edge uh, demonstrator prototype built by the US military towards next-generation stealth combat drones that would operate in denied areas, uh, so against really advanced militaries. Uh, it's now a museum piece, but at the time was sort of the first drone to really demonstrate this potential. We've now seen a number of other countries follow suit. Uh, the UK, France, uh, India, Israel, Russia, and China have all built uh, things like this, prototypes of stealth combat drones that are designed to operate in heavily contested areas. So places where the enemy will have advanced air defense systems that might be able to shoot down the kinds of drones that people operate today. Now, the central question that the book grapples with and what I'll talk about today is, as we see more autonomy in drones, how far is that going to go? And what happens when a Predator drone has as much autonomy as a self-driving car? When we're talking about lethal decision making on a battlefield. These drones, they are already armed. That's actually not the question. So science fiction kind of tells us this story about how robots become more advanced, and then at some point in time they turn on humanity and they go arm themselves and attack us. What we're actually seeing in the real world is ever more advanced military robotic systems that are being born with a gun in their hands. And the question is, how much freedom are we going to delegate to these machines when it comes to life and death decisions on the battlefield? So. Uh, so I want to walk through some of the examples of technology that we're seeing. It's not just uh, aerial drones that are having more autonomy. Um, we also see this in uh, ground and at sea as well. This is uh, a fully uninhabited boat. You can see there's no one on the boat, no one driving it. Uh, it's being driven autonomously. This is a uh, demonstration by the Office of Naval Research uh, in the United States that was done on the James River in Virginia several years ago now, where they actually had Five boats like this operating together as a team or a swarm, uh, if you will, uh, working cooperatively. And in this case, what they were doing was helping to defend a U.S. Navy ship that was doing a mock strait transit. So there are lots of places around the globe where Navy ships have to move through narrow straits and they're potentially vulnerable to attack. Um, 
In particular, in the Strait of uh, Hormuz, the Navy, U.S. Navy receives regular harassment from Iranian small boats that come and uh, operate near U.S. naval vessels. And so one of the goals would be um, an uninhabited boat like this that could be sort of an extra layer of defenses that could go out, could interrogate uh, potentially suspicious vessels that might be approaching, and could get eyes on them without putting people at risk. So if it turns out that they're packed with explosives, as we saw in the USS Cole terrorist attack, blew up a, a Navy ship, um, that there's no sailors actually at risk. And that's what's being done in this demonstration, is as a suspicious vessel approached, a, a human told these ships or these boats, uh, go intercept. The boats that autonomously did that all on their own, they went and they intercepted it and encircled this, you know, sort of suspicious vessel, right? It was all a demonstration. Now, uh, what was interesting is in this case, the Navy was very public about this. They were very clearly trying to demonstrate uh, a military capability to another country. Uh, they didn't say Iran, but uh, I can say Iran uh, was clearly the intended target here of the, the messaging. And in this demonstration, one of the boats was armed, had a 50 caliber machine gun on it. So they invite press and they're talking about this and they're talking about autonomy and swarming. And one of the reporters said, um, you know, I see the one of these boats is armed. Uh, what about that? Like, is that autonomous? Who's in charge of the shooting? And the Navy, I kid you not, at the time, their answer was, well, we're not really sure yet. <laughs> we haven't decided. Uh, which, you know, the reporter loved, gave a great headline, um, but actually speaks to the reality of where many militaries are with this technology, which is to say that they're investing in more autonomy. They can see the value in it today but there are these decisions coming down the road about things like lethal autonomy that they just haven't actually made up their minds yet on. Now, it's not just uh, the US military that's investing in this technology. Like I said, uh, drones are all around the world. Same is true uh, on land and at sea. This is the Israeli Guardian uh, uninhabited ground vehicle. Uh, this one has been reportedly uh, deployed to the Gaza border, so it's been used. And there are versions of this that are armed, so you can't see it in this photograph, um, but there are versions that do have weapons on them. And Israel has said that while this robotic system will be driving itself, that humans will all be, always be in charge of using uh, the weapons on board. Now, not all countries necessarily see that the same way. This is the Russian Urine 9. Uh, it's a, a much larger ground vehicle. Uh, if it had people, you might say it's an armored personnel carrier, but no one on board. It has not only a heavy caliber machine gun there, but also anti-tank rockets. So this is really designed to go after other uh, nations' armored ground forces. Uh, it's, a, it's a tank killer, if you will. And um, Russia has been much more aggressive in prototyping these kinds of systems, actually some early deployment, and then how they talk about this technology. So the Euro 9 was actually sent to Syria a few years ago and reportedly did not do very well. Uh, it was pulled back after a few weeks due to uh, communications challenges, which suggested it actually didn't have that much autonomy, um, which would be a way to overcome some of these communication problems. But it shows that the Russian military is willing to experiment in ways that many others are not. And senior Russian generals have said that their vision is to build fully roboticized units that are capable of independent operations. Now, what exactly that means, I think, is a little bit unclear, um, but it certainly does not signal the kind of restraint that you often hear from Western leaders. Uh, another example here is this is the X-47. This was another prototype aircraft built by the US Navy. This was the first aircraft to, uh, first robotic aircraft I want no human on board to autonomously take off and land on an aircraft carrier. And one of the interesting problems that comes up with this kind of system, you can see based on its kind of shape, it's intended to be uh, a bridge towards a stealthy aircraft that would operate inside denied areas, is that against a more capable adversary, which is what this is really aiming towards, if you're operating, say, among air defense systems, any country that can build the kind of air defense systems that would require these kinds of stealth characteristics also has the ability to disrupt communications. So they might jam your communications or at least degrade them in ways that make it harder to talk to this robotic aircraft when it's operating out there. Which raises really challenging questions like, well, what do you want it to do? 
if it's out on its own. Uh, this very simple question was what actually motivated the Defense Department to come up with its internal policy guidance on the role of autonomy in weapons. I was working at the time at the Pentagon, and I asked my boss, uh, I said, well, you know, we're building things like this. If it's out on its own, and we've lost communications with it, and it's deep inside enemy territory, what should it do? Does it come home? Does it take photographs uh, and then come back? Would you allow it to strike pre-planned fixed targets that a human had already approved? That's basically how a cruise missile functions today, so that's not really new. Is that acceptable? Um, what if it came across what the military would call targets of opportunity? Many of the things the military cares about are mobile and relocatable targets. So you can imagine, for example, uh, North Korean nuclear missile launchers. Well, those are mobile, right? The North Koreans aren't going to lock them in one place. In a conflict, you would really want to take those out quickly. There could be millions of lives at stake if you could strike those before they're launched. Do you want it to wait if it came across that kind of target? Or would you be willing to delegate that kind of decision making to the machine? Uh, so these are actually very practical kind of real world questions that militaries will have to face as they get further down the road with this technology. Uh, this is uh, a totally robotic ship that the U.S. Navy built. Uh, you can see people on it uh, in this photograph, obviously. Um, but it is, um, it is able to operate autonomously at sea. In fact, last year it sailed autonomously from San Diego to Hawaii with only some very uh, brief stops of people on board just to do the maintenance. That's actually the hardest part right now for these robotic ships is doing the maintenance with no humans on board. Uh, but it can operate entirely on its own and is now part of the U.S. Navy's fleet. And the Navy is looking to build more of these and to scale them up in larger size. This illustrates another sort of challenge that can come uh, in the sea domain or the ground domain. It doesn't really happen as much in the air, which is the risk of someone trying to do a hostile boarding of this kind of vessel. So the mission of this ship is to track enemy submarines. It is intended to continuously trail submarines, uh, monitoring information about them. Now, this would require a lot of sensitive equipment on board, the kind of thing that you don't want falling into the enemy's hands. There was an incident a few years ago where uh, the Chinese Navy went and grabbed a hold of a U.S. robot underwater drone that was operating in the South China Sea. There was no one there to stop them. They just went and they just took it. And the U.S. protested. They said, give us our drone back. And uh, after a couple of days, the, the Chinese finally did. But you might imagine that you don't want this technology falling into the hands of your enemy. It could be very sensitive equipment that you don't want them pulling apart and reverse engineering. So what would you allow it to do then in that situation? Would it be allowed to defend itself autonomously? Um, and, and would it do so with maybe a lethal force or some other mechanism? Again, these are very practical questions that militaries are going to have to address as they build these kinds of systems. Now, it's not just uh, vehicles that we see more autonomy in, uh, but also in missiles or torpedoes underwater. Uh, this is the screenshot of a computer video of uh, a next generation system called the LRASM, or Long Range Anti Ship Missile, LRASM, uh, there. And one of the features that it does, it's a little bit new is it can autonomously change its route. So the human chooses the destination. The human uh, has some indications that there is an enemy ship uh, somewhere out at sea. It's an anti-ship missile, so the human says, you know, go attack this ship. But if the missile comes across uh, what the military would call a pop-up threat that happens while it's navigating there, and that's what this red bubble here is intended to represent, well, the missile can then change its route to get there. And it's an illustration of sort of this trend of, of creeping autonomy in military systems. So much like you see in automobiles, where with each generation of car, you see more autonomous features. Things like self-parking, intelligent cruise control, automatic braking. It's the same in military systems, that you see sort of these incremental advancements in autonomy. Now, one of the differences is it's not totally clear in the military where you're trying to go. Uh, people, I think, sort of understand that the timeline in which we get there may be uncertain, but the goal of self-driving cars uh, that might have fewer accidents than humans, save lives, is kind of the, the end goal that we'd like to get to. But there's, of course, a tremendous amount of debate 
about what the goal is here with it more autonomy in military systems and where we ought to end up in the future. I want to take a step back for a little bit and talk about the way that autonomy has historically been incorporated into weapons. So I think a very helpful context for this debate, where we're going in the future. Uh, the military has had uh, what I'll call semi-autonomous weapons, weapons that use some degree of autonomy for decades, dating back to World War II. Uh, this is an example of one. It's called the Harm missile, high-speed uh, anti-radiation missile. It's being loaded here onto a Navy F-18. And it is uh, one example of what I will call in general a semi-autonomous weapon system here um, in the blue. And this is the kind of weapon where a human chooses the target, a human has some indication that there is a valid enemy target in some point in time and space. It may not be a lot of information. It may not be perfect real-time information about uh, the battlefield. Uh, you may have heard about the, the fog of war. That's a, uh, not, a, not a physical phenomenon like the, this fog, right? But, um, but sort of a metaphor for the confusion that can happen in combat and is very much a reality of combat. So, Military commanders never have perfect information about what's going on, but they might have some information that leads them to believe that there is an enemy target in some point in time and space. And based on that information, they might launch a weapon to go attack that target. And once released, many of these weapons are what the military would call fire and forget weapons. Once you let it go, you're not getting that thing back. And that's, it, in and of itself, that's not a new development in war. An arrow is a fire and forget weapon. Can't recall that. What is new is in the 20th century, uh, there was the advent of seekers on board these weapons that could actually sense enemy targets. The first of these were acoustic sensors on torpedoes that could listen to the sound of ships' propellers in World War II. And so rather than having to precisely aim a torpedo against a ship, which is of course moving and trying not to get blown up, um, these homing torpedoes could listen to the sound of ship's propellers and then maneuver while they were uh, driving towards the ship to correct for any aiming errors. And this kind of technology has now proliferated to all aspects of warfare, is used uh, at sea, in the air, on ground, um, and by militaries all around the globe, and really been widely used for 70 years. And we've not seen, I mean, there are sometimes accidents, but certainly these weapons have not brought about uh, the robopocalypse. So when people raise concerns about autonomous weapons, uh, this is generally speaking uh, not what they are concerned about. They're talking about some future weapon that I'll call here uh, in red a fully autonomous weapon that would go out on its own and find targets where humans haven't said uh, where the targets are. Now, humans, of course, are building these weapons. They're programming them. They're telling the weapons what kinds of things to look for. But a human doesn't need to say, look, there are tanks right here. Go kill these tanks. It might say, well, go look for things that look like tanks. And look over a wide area and find them. And if you find them, then attack them. Uh, there are some narrow examples of this that I'll talk about. Um, but by and large, you could separate, uh, make a distinction of these as things that are in existence today, we have a lot of familiarity with, and things that would be generally new, or at least are not widely used in warfare today. But let's talk about the caveats, because they're important here. Uh, so one is that there's a whole slew of automated defensive systems that are in existence today. Uh, this is the Counter Rocket Artillery and Mortar System, or CRAM. It's a U.S. Army version of a gun called the Phalanx or a Sea Whiz gun that's on U.S. Navy ships. This is sometimes referred to as R2-D2 because of the little dome kind of shape here. And it's used to shoot against incoming rockets or artillery or mortars uh, on land or missiles at sea that are coming in to, uh, in speed, to really too fast for humans to respond. So you could have these things coming in so fast, and there's so many of them, that there's no way for humans to adequately respond in time. Um, and so you need automated systems to do that. And militaries have been using automated defensive systems of this type for several decades. They are widely used around the globe. This is the Patriot Air Defense System that also has automatic modes. Uh, the Aegis Combat System on Navy ships. And there are at least 30 countries that have automated missile defense systems of this kind of type today. So they're used all around the globe. Um, 
to the extent that I use US systems that's, uh, in, these, in these presentations, that's just because it's easiest for copyright reasons uh, to get a hold of those pictures. But these are, again, widely used by over 30 countries today. Um, there are some, these are all used in a defensive way. So in an offensive way, there are a few narrow examples of autonomous weapons that are used offensively. One is the Israeli Harpy drone, uh, depicted here. Uh, and so promotional materials from the defense contractor. Now, uh, it's called a drone. It's a kamikaze weapon. It's one way. So you really actually don't want this coming back at you. Uh, it is probably more accurately referred to as a loitering munition. So what this does is, like the harm missile that I referred to earlier, uh, it goes after what the military calls anti-radiation systems, basically radars that are irradiating in the electromagnetic spectrum. So these are relatively easy targets to go after because they're basically broadcasting where they are. They're sending out electromagnetic signals. So all you need to do is sense that signal, know what frequency to look for, and then zero in on it, and the machine can go right after it and attack it. Uh, what this does that's different, though, than most of these anti-radar missiles is it searches over a wide area. So while the harm missile is only active for a few minutes, this one can loiter for up to two and a half hours, which means it can search a much wider area, it can search for several hundred kilometers, and it also means that the human launching it doesn't need to know where the radars are. I mean, not precisely. You just have to say, well, in a general sense, there ought to be radars in this area. You don't need to know exactly where they are. Um, and this weapon can go look for them on their own. So it begins to ever so slightly change the role that humans have in relation to the use of force. Humans are now a little bit more removed, not physically, but cognitively from these decisions. And they're handing over a little bit more decision making to the machines. This again is not a radically new development in war. The Harpy has been around since the 90s. Um, there are weapons of this type dating back to the 80s. This is the Tomahawk anti-ship missile, um, or TASM. Uh, that was a US Navy system in the 80s. This is a, it's a little bit grainy because it's actually a, um, from a, a brochure that the Defense Department had uh, in the 80s about this. And it was intended to uh, be launched over the horizon to go after Soviet ships. So it would be launched from a ship or a submarine. It would cruise out over the horizon and then find the search pattern looking for Soviet ships. So this was actually an active weapon in the US Navy inventory in the 80s, uh, eventually taken out of service. And talking to uh, Navy surface warfare officers at the time, one of the things they said is there was actually a lot of discomfort among the military about using this weapon. Because one of the concerns was, look, if you don't know exactly where the Soviet ships are, why are you launching this in the first place? And people didn't have a lot of comfort about its ability to discriminate between valid enemy warships and merchant vessels that might be out on the high seas, might be in the wrong area. And they also were concerned um, that over the time horizon it takes for this uh, missile to get there, the ship will have moved, which is why this, of course, is flying a search pattern to look for the ship. But it might miss the ship, might hit the wrong thing. It simply uh, might, might be wasted. Um, and then maybe one reason why we haven't seen more weapon systems of this type come along. But drones begin to change this equation because drones are now recoverable. So if you can launch a drone and it flies around, it doesn't find anything, it could come home the next day and you haven't wasted it at all. And in fact, you can continue to reuse it. So it may be that we see more uh, militaries be willing to delegate this kind of authority to drones where they're, they're a recoverable asset unlike a missile. Now we're seeing um, people really pushing the bounds in research and development with autonomy. Uh, this is a, a shot of some small drones being built at the Naval Postgraduate School out in Monterey, California. Uh, I opened the book with a scene where I, I went and saw a demonstration of what they were doing there where they're building these small, cheap styrofoam drones. Uh, they're very inexpensive, so they could build a whole lot of them. The uh, most expensive thing on this is actually the GoPro camera on it. And what I saw them doing was doing an actual aerial mock dogfight. So real flying, uh, simulated shooting, but all the flying and maneuvering was real, totally autonomous, between two aerial swarms. So swarm versus swarm combat. So them trying to understand really the tactics of how do you fight with swarms? 
what are the right tactics and maneuver when you put them up in the air together? Um, what are the, the right sort of plays, if you will, that the swarm should be running to outmaneuver against another swarm? What was really fascinating about seeing this was uh, when they were doing these sort of mock dogfights, they had two humans in charge of this one. So they had a red swarm and a blue swarm. Uh, the military loves sort of red versus uh, blue in their color scheme. And uh, they had a human in charge of each. And they had a referee counting down. When they got down to zero, each of the human red and blue swarm commanders reached forward on their laptops and they pressed enter. And that was it. That was all I had to do. Everything else was totally autonomous. All of the maneuvering and coordination among the elements. And what they were doing there was pretty crude, pretty simplistic. Uh, the algorithms were not very advanced. But they were trying to take what a lot of they've done in modeling and simulation inside computers and put this out in the real world. So to do some real experiments with it. And they're working up to a 50 versus 50 aerial swarm dogfight at the time when I, when I talk with them. So it's one example of how we're seeing people sort of start to push the boundaries of not just thinking about the technology, but also the tactics that go, go along with this, which is really essential for militaries to harness this technology. Now, it's not just in physical space that we see more autonomy. This is, uh, uh, we we'll see this in cyberspace, more autonomy in cyber tools. This is the spread of one variant of Stuxnet across the internet as it spread from an initial point here in purple uh, across different nodes of a network attacking what um, security researchers believe was its intended target, uh, Iranian centrifuges at Natanz. We're also seeing more advancements in autonomy in cyberspace. This is uh, a computer system called Mayhem, which was the winner of DARPA's Cyber Grand Challenge a few years ago that was doing autonomous uh, cyber reasoning, basically looking for bugs in software, totally autonomously, finding them, and then either patching them on your own network or exploiting these vulnerabilities in your opponent's network. Uh, totally dual use technology. Uh, the same technology that's used to do cyber defenses in this case is also used for cyber offensive operations. And this technology is now actually uh, employed by the Defense Department. So I want to talk briefly about sort of the legal and ethical and policy dimensions of this. Uh, the legal things come up first. People say, well, what does the laws of war have to say about autonomous weapons? Uh, what's interesting is not very much. Uh, the laws of war lay out uh, really rules for how militaries should conduct themselves on the battlefield. They don't say anything explicitly about autonomous weapons. Now, there's a couple ways to interpret this. One is that what really matters is the way that militaries conduct themselves and the ways that they avoid civilian harm. And if autonomous weapons do a better job of that than people, then we should use them. In fact, we might even be obligated to use them, one could argue, uh, legally or, or ethically. Another perspective is that um, you know, the laws of war don't say anything about autonomous weapons because this was never an issue until now. They never said explicitly humans have to make these decisions. It was always implicit. Humans were doing it. But now that this decision is upon us, we should write these rules down. And there's certainly um, a, a movement among uh, engineers, among people in the human rights community, uh, among some robotics companies uh, that are not military robotics companies, but commercial ones, saying, you know, we should uh, have some kind of international treaty or new law of war that would prohibit uh, lethal autonomous weapons. Um, what is interesting is that there is an important asymmetry in the laws of war between humans and machines, and that's that humans are legal agents and machines are not. So an autonomous weapon is no more a legal agent under the laws of war than a rifle would be. Um, and so it's ultimately a human responsibility to comply with the laws of war. And that would seem to put at least some minimum bounds on human involvement in these decisions about the use of force. But what that is, is I think not very clear right now. I also want to talk about some of the moral or ethical questions that might come that are outside of the laws of war. Certainly the laws of war capture a lot of important rules for behavior, but there are sometimes things that maybe aren't written down in the laws of war that are important. Um, there was an incident uh, that I was involved in when I was uh, an army ranger in uh, the wars in Afghanistan, very early in the war in Afghanistan. 
I was part of an Army Ranger sniper team that was up on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. And we were there to, it was an area, it was not uh, this area, this sort of a DOD uh, stock area, but it looked a lot like this, actually. And we'd infiltrated at night up a ridge line uh, much like this. And when dawn came, we were fairly well exposed. We didn't have a lot of vegetation. And um, I expected some fighters to come and attack us. What actually happened is they sent a little girl to scout out a position. She was maybe five or six. She had a couple goats in tow. I think ostensibly that she was kind of herding goats uh, as cover, but, but it was pretty clear she was there to check us out. And uh, she's not very sneaky, to be honest. She kind of walked a circle around us and she stared at us and we stared back at her. And we heard the chirping of what we later realized was a radio that she had on her. On her. She was reporting back information about us. So we watched her for a while, and she watched us, and then she left. And not long after, some Taliban fighters uh, did come to attack us. So we, we took care of them, and, and the gunfight that ensued kind of brought out the whole valley, so we had to leave. Uh, but we were talking later that day about how we deal with a similar situation like that. What would we do if we came across someone? Uh, so something that did not come up as a point of conversation was the idea of shooting this little girl. No one suggested that we should do that. Now, what's interesting is under the laws of war, that would have been legal. The laws of war don't set an age for combatants. Your status as a combatant is based on your actions. And by scouting for the enemy, she was directly participating in hostilities, the same way as if she'd been an 18-year-old man doing that same activity. So under the laws of war, it would have been legal to shoot her. Now, I would say that that would have been morally wrong. Uh, that's certainly not consistent with the values I was raised with, uh, and I don't think consistent with American values. There are many things in war that force difficult choices on soldiers, but I don't think this was one of them. I think it was pretty clear cut, actually. Um, but it begs the question of how would a robot know the difference between what is legal and what is right? If you built a robot to perfectly comply with the laws of war, it would have shot this little girl. If it was intelligent enough to sort of really interpret the environment and make these kinds of legal determinations. And so that's, it, I think, an important dimension to bring into the conversation is to think about uh, human values, uh, the values that we bring as a military, as a nation uh, to war, and how we think about ensuring that the technology we use is going to operate in consistent with those values. And the last thing I want to raise is concerns about whether autonomous weapons might be destabilizing in some way to international peace and security. Um, so what would a world look like if nations were heavily invested in highly autonomous systems that could operate at machine speed, faster than humans, um, would there be risks that come with that? Well, we have seen what this looks like actually in other domains, like in stock trading. And we've seen things like flash crashes that can come because of the brittleness of machine decision making that are at least exacerbated by risks of high frequency trading. And then when we have machines operating in a competitive landscape at machine speed faster than humans can respond, you get these weird interaction effects like flash crashes on Wall Street. <coughs> and something like this in war, a flash war, would not benefit anyone. Uh, that even militaries uh, that don't like each other, even nations that are heavily invested in getting ahead in technology like artificial intelligence to gain an edge on one another, uh, they certainly have no interest in accidents that might spark a conflict. So how do we think about ways to, to diminish those risks? What's interesting is in stock trading, what has happened is regulators have put in uh, what they call circuit breakers to take stocks offline if uh, they move too quickly in one direction or another. But if we're going to have something analogous to that in warfare, there is no referee to call timeout in war. There's no sort of neutral third party that can do that. So these would have to be uh, circuit breakers that militaries invest in themselves or ways that they actually work with their adversaries to avoid these kind of accidents, which, needless to say, is very challenging. So there have been discussions going on at the UN um, for several years now. Uh, this is from a few years ago. Uh, that's uh, me sitting uh, uh, here next to um, some NGO uh, uh, participants that are leaders of the campaign to stop killing robots. Um, I'm not a part of them. We're just sitting next to each other uh, here, uh, as, long as, as long as some representatives of the International Committee of the Red Cross and uh, nations involved in discussions at the UN, at the uh, 
The relatively awkwardly named Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, or CCW, uh, that is the forum in the UN process uh, where we've seen debates now for several years on autonomous weapons. Uh, it's not making loads of progress, to be honest with you, but it is, I think, encouraging the countries that are coming together to discuss this topic um, proactively, really, as the technology is evolving, and at least we're getting countries in the room together and they're, they're talking about it. I want to close with a quote from uh, General Paul Selva. He's the former uh, vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, pictured uh, here in the background in the foreground, uh, former Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work, who was one of the leading champions of autonomy and artificial intelligence when he was in the Pentagon. Uh, here, Selva says, I think we should all be advocates for keeping the ethical rules of war in place, lest we unleash on humanity a set of robots that we don't know how to control. This is him testifying before uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee a few years ago. And I think this is really relevant because, you know, here is the number two military uh, leader in the U.S. military talking about things like ethics and humanity, um, which I think is important when you see a senior military uh, commander talking about some of these concerns. But also I'll point this out that what's interesting about this sentiment is it's hard to know how you put this into practice. So if you said, you know, got it, boss, this is the rule, we're going to do this, I don't know how you translate this into guidance to engineers. How do you tell engineers when they're writing in code, how do you take these sort of vague concepts and then instantiate these into, into actual code that would drive machine decision making? And uh, that's one of the challenges in this area is trying to translate some of these high-level ideas into actual practice. And as we go forward, how do we find opportunities to use this technology in ways that might make uh, military operations more precise, more humane, might reduce civilian casualties, uh, certainly protect uh, U.S. service members and U.S. allies, but find ways to do so that doesn't lose our humanity in the process. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop there. We should have plenty of time uh, for questions from everyone. Thanks so much. Um, I, I feel like when like watching your presentation, like doing the reading we, and talking about it in class, I see a lot of parallels with uh, like nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation. Um, like obviously at this point in the stage of the technology, at a lot lower of a threat level than say like Soviet issues at that time, but still the same, a lot of parallels. Uh, do you think that we could use like how we dealt with those nuclear issues like non-proliferation agreements and those kind of things to do a similar thing or is the startup investment different like I know the startup investment on the nuclear weapons program is really really high is it similar with this like yeah I mean I think it's it's a useful historical touch point right to look at um, this technology in particular because nuclear weapons are so obviously a military technology where all of these kind of strategic dimensions are so relevant, right? And there was, so there has been such a long and robust effort at, at restraint and regulating nuclear weapons. They're certainly not seen as like normal weapons, right? Nuclear weapons, um, at least today, are not seen as just a bigger bomb. Um, there are lots of places where, you know, in detail, the comparison like sort of breaks down, right? And one of them is clearly the um, threshold for acquisition. One of the reasons why nuclear non-proliferation has been reasonably successful um, in at least sort of slowing the spread of nuclear weapons is because it's very hard to build a nuclear weapon. I mean, it takes a reasonably sized state, an effort of, you know, years to put together all of the uh, you know, really components of the weapon, particularly the nuclear fuel cycle and enrichment to build a weapon. And those barriers to entry just don't exist with this. Um, one of the things I looked at uh, for my book is how hard would it be to build a crude autonomous weapon in your garage? It is terrifyingly possible. Um, all of the basic components are already out there. You can buy a small drone for a few hundred bucks online. Um, certainly uh, in America, weapons are easy to come by. You could put a gun on a drone. Um, people have already done that. That uh, 
seems to be there's two things that people do when they get a hold of drones, whether it's an individual or a country. Uh, they fly it someplace it doesn't belong, and they put a gun on it. And uh, we've already seen people do that in the U.S., uh, armed, small hobbyist drones. Interestingly, uh, not illegal in the U.S. actually to do that. Um, uh, there's a case a few years ago where a teenager in Connecticut uh, put a flamethrower on a drone and uh, based it at Turkey for Thanksgiving, put a YouTube video up on it, uh, and the FBI and the FAA investigated, and as long as you're on private property and below a certain you know, altitude, like, yeah, fair game, totally, totally legal in the U.S. Um, I'm not saying it's recommended, but, uh, but, but there you have it. Yeah, if you wanted to, you know, it's, it's, at least the FBI is not going to come kind of rush you for it. So, so this is, um, you know, the real missing component is the intelligence behind the system, right, to build something that's actually autonomous. All of those piece components are also available online. You could download on places like GitHub, you know, train neural networks that can identify people as objects. Uh, I am not a computer programmer. I'm a policy person. It took me a few minutes online to find those. Um, it's sort of well within the realm of an undergraduate CS major to kind of put these things together. I actually, in the course of uh, doing, doing sort of presentations for the book, was giving a talk like this at a university. Uh, I won't say which one. Um, and afterwards, uh, a robotics professor pulled me aside and said, I want to go show you something. And I'm like, okay. Took me down to his lab, uh, shows me this laptop he's got rigged up. And next to the laptop is this little robot arm, and it's got a little airsoft pistol in the arm. And the laptop has a camera on it, and I see my face kind of in the camera, right? And there's a little box. And like, I don't know, I honestly don't, don't know what I was thinking. But um, instinctively, like, I see the box, it's kind of like lean my head into the camera to like align with the box. Uh, now I'm thinking about it, and the box goes like yellow, and the robot pulls the trigger. <laughs> and I hear it like a chunk as this thing like tries to shoot me in the face. <laughs> and luckily like it didn't have anything in it. It wasn't like, well, I'm just, but I almost jumped out of my skin and I was like, oh, like your robot just tried to shoot me. And he was like, yeah, isn't that cool? And I was like, well, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, at a minimum, it's a little bit rude. Uh, and like, you know, newsflash, some people might be upset about what you're doing. This is kind of like a debate. Uh, it's kind of a thing. And I was like, so this is fast. And once I got over that, I was like, this is really interesting. How long did it take you to do this? And I was like, oh, I did this in the afternoon. He was like, I just downloaded the software, made a few changes to a line of code. It was super easy. It was like the hardest part was actually physically wiring in uh, the, the components into the pistol. That was actually the hardest part of it. So all of the technology, this is widely available today. Um, so you're not going to stop, you know, like, like the sort of the analogy to sort of stopping nuclear enrichment, some key component of the supply chain to build this technology. That just doesn't exist in this case. Um, it's not to say that regulation is not possible or it's inconceivable. Um, there are other technologies that are similarly regulated. Look at regulations on landmines. They're not actually regulating the underlying technology to build a landmine that most countries could build. Nevertheless, um, the bans on landmines have been reasonably successful in getting most countries in the world to give up stockpiles of landmines. Now, not all of them, um, certainly not major military powers. Uh, one might argue that it's simply a product of a very brief period of, uh, of relative peace. In the 90s and early 2000s, if you're a country like the Ukraine, you're probably looking at your decision to give up landmines differently today, right? Um, and if you were trying to push for a similar disarmament campaign against landmines today, that may not be as successful. Um, but, but people certainly look to historical examples of both successful and failed attempts at regulating weapons as touch points for thinking about this. One of the interesting, challenging aspects of this is there are enough historical examples of successes and failures, people that kind of pick whatever historical examples that benefits their argument, right? So if people say, you know, we should ban these weapons, they could say, well, you know, we've banned cluster munitions and landmines and chemical weapons and biological weapons and blinding lasers, and there's lots of examples for this, and we should do it with these weapons today. If you 
don't want to do that, people ignore those examples and instead they talk about attempts to ban um, air delivered weapons in the early 20th century and the use of aircraft or regulations on submarines or attempts to um, uh, have arms control treaties for like the size of battleships and the numbers of them, all of which were short lived and failed. And they say like this is futile. Uh, people love, love to bring up uh, the papal decrees in the Middle Ages against the crossbow, which had uh, no effect, as near as we can tell, based on the historical record, uh, on the spread of the crossbow across medieval Europe. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a challenging issue. There are successful examples of regulating weapons, but there's a, there's a whole lot of failures, too. Uh, yes? Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about, so, like, the, your presentation was very much like this, like, human decision-making, and then there's, like, you know, autonomous uh, AI-driven decision-making and then sort of uh, this middle category of maybe drones where you have to just sort of extend it, like the human yes. uh, agent through like distal action and yes. so like, And so uh, a thing that I worry about a lot is like how human decision-making actually might change. Yes. So, so the, which was sort of left out. So, and, but uh, you've probably thought about it. So like the, the, in, in the drone case, we already have some knowledge now that, that the human agent really changes through this sort of distal action and perception and that how it feels morally different, right? So your examples with the little child and like, you know, like maybe like you, know, you could say sort of a, a human um, muffler on, on, on some of the, the er, 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 eradication, like, the, like you have the stock example, right? Like, and, and like human morality is really a, a, a thing that sort of puts a, a damper, you could say, on certain, certain actions. But it seems that that damper is different, even when the human is the, in the position of the decision making, when you have uh, distal uh, weapons and like interfaces, right? Um, so both like in cyberspace and in terms of drones. And so I was wondering how if we can like so like you had your example there with the more like we have to you know human morality versus these autonomous weapons, but I, I fear that human morality is what's going to change. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think you hit your nail right on the head, which is that it's it's really about um, how does technology change human decision making and. A lot of the attention for drones today is sort of on the physical distance. And people will say things like, well, you know, we don't have our airmen in harm's way then, right? They're not in harm's way, which is, A, like not really why the military uses drones versus uh, human inhabited aircraft. Like when they look at the relative capabilities, it's not about putting people at risk. It's not what's motivating the military. But it's also, I think, less significant actually and that the long arc of technology and warfare has been towards trying to find ways to create greater distance between yourself and your enemy while still being able to hurt them while they can't hurt you that's for the first time someone picked up a rock and threw it at someone else or used a club to hit somebody that's sort of been the evolution of technology in war so i see that as less significant of a break the physical distance um uh, the, for the U.S. military, probably the most dramatic breaks have been really the U.S. dominance in air power that has allowed the U.S. to actually prosecute campaigns like the Kosovo Air War with sort of a zero casualty goal, actually, um, without putting people in harm's way, even when they're humans in the cockpit. Um, or perhaps from a bureaucratic standpoint, the innovation of an all-volunteer military, right, that's able to sort of segregate um, the American public from, from casualties in a very significant way that affects them political decision making. Um, uh, I'm not sure the drones is, is it's more of, more of an incremental step relative to probably those two things. But this question of sort of how does it change the human sort of cognitive role is a very interesting one. Now, if you just look, if you take technology out of the equation, um, and you look on the battlefield, there's been some really interesting studies about sort of the psychology of killing in war that shows that there's sort of this immediate physical relationship, be uh, relationship between sort of the physical distance between a combatant and the person they're attacking and their psychological distance, right? So if you're right up close, you can see that the person you're killing is like a human and you can't really deny that what you're doing is you get further and further away that maybe it's less obvious that they're a person, they're sort of a shape and a blur and you shoot them and they go down and maybe you hit them, maybe they ducked, maybe someone else hit them. It's, you, you can create more sort of cognitive separation for the human. Um, 
Technology can start to mediate that in complicated ways. Um, it can start to become an intermediate device that maybe the human um, uh, feels less directly connected to what they're doing. At the same, you know, mash on my microphone uh, for, <laughs> for people watching this on YouTube. Um, it can also, however, in some cases, sort of close that psychological gap. And that's one of the things that drones do. One of the things that's fascinating is there's a huge disconnect between how the public talks about the psychological aspects of drones, which is largely uninformed by what's actually happening and what's actually going on in the military, because the military doesn't really talk much about this. We see rates of, you know, significant rates of post-traumatic stress from drone operators, precisely because the reality of what they're doing is very immediate and apparent to them, because they actually have a closer psychological relationship with what's happening than, say, the pilot directly overhead. Right? If you're in an F-16 overhead, you have maybe a small display, you zip in, drop some bombs on a target, you're gone. Um, if you're a drone operator, you have this high fidelity, full motion camera. You can see what's occurring. You've been watching a target for days or weeks leading up to a strike. You watch the aftermath of the strike. You see the people come up and collect the bodies. So like, there's really no way to deny what's occurring. The sort of the, the, the concept of it being sort of a video game is something that you'll hear sometimes in the, in the public discussion and like sort of sends people involved in these operations just like through the roof because it's not at all the reality of what they see. So that's a case where even though the physical distance is quite great, we're on the other side of the planet, the psychological distance is sort of closed by the technology. Now, you can imagine lots of new technology that then begin to change that. So you add in automation, let's say you just had an automated decision tool that begins to make recommendations to people. Here's an enemy target, strike it, right? There are ways in which how you present that information to people might make it very real to the human, might make them own that decision, or you might present information in ways that allow them to sort of begin cognitively offloading responsibility, right? Um, and, uh, uh, Missy Cummings is a researcher down at Duke uh, who runs a lab called Humans and Automation Lab. She's a former F-18 pilot who's written extensively on this kind of issue of like, what is the human-machine relationship? What is the human interface? Um, but you can imagine if you think about, you know, like a, um, even something like a personified decision aid, a little, you know, clippy like the Microsoft Office paperclip from, yeah, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, right? That might um, allow humans to then begin offloading more responsibility to the machines that might reduce rates of post-traumatic stress because people no longer feel responsible, but might also then um, reduce human involvement in those decisions. And it's a, I think it's a really interesting issue because it's one where, um, you're really actually balancing these two sort of competing things, right? Which is to say that when humans are morally involved in killing, that comes at a price. It comes at a price like now we see people sort of waking up to the concept of moral injury in war, right? It comes at a price of the moral burden afterwards of people suffering post-traumatic stress. Um, and, and that's very real. Right? And that's a real burden that's placed on uh, individuals. And it is really ultimately a tragedy that as a society we decide as a nation, as a democratic nation, to go to war. Um, whether, you know, maybe through our elected leaders, but ultimately the society as a whole bears responsibility for that decision. And it's a very small number of people that actually have to live with those consequences, not just themselves at risk, but also the moral burden of those decisions. They're the ones that maybe have to have to live with the human cost of that. Um, but it's worth asking if no one bore that moral burden, right? If no one slept uneasy at night, uh, what would that say about us as a society or about the military sort of ethics and values? So it's, an I think, an interesting ethical challenge to think about. Yeah. yeah, so sort of similar to that question, the previous question actually. Um, you mentioned, for example, Stuxnet in the presentation, and also recently we have the, the drone attack on Soleimani, the Iranian general. And it seems we see this pattern of uh, maybe attacks using autonomous or semi autonomous or unmanned weapons being maybe lower on a chain of escalation yeah. than like conventional attacks. I'm curious if you agree with that, and if so, do you see that continuing or, or shifting in the coming years as these things proliferate? Yeah, I mean, I would say that I don't think it's a function of the autonomy. Um, 
I think what you um, see is certainly cyber tools are seen as, depending on what you're doing with cyber tools, right, as not necessarily as escalatory as other things. So if you're going in and stealing data, um, DOJ just um, announced that it had been some Chinese military folks behind the Equifax hack, for example, right? Um, so those kinds of things are often seen as less escalatory than, say, blowing something up or attacking something, um, uh, or attacks on electoral systems or propaganda, disinformation involved in disrupting elections is sometimes seen as much less escalatory than, than an armed attack. Um, I think some of those things are, are, you know, those are ultimately social constructs. They're about how people respond. Right? So if someone does something and then you say, hey, that was a big deal, and you respond as though it's a big deal, then they're going to treat it that way next time. Right? Um, I think in many cases, actually, the U.S. government has, been, um, has made some serious missteps in the way it's responded to cyber attacks, um, particularly attacks against our um, election infrastructure, in ways that then invite further attacks. Right? So it's sort of like there's a lot of hand-wringing in Washington sometimes about cyber attacks. Like, oh, people keep attacking us. Uh, what do we do? How do we make it stop? Well, you need to respond, actually, right? If the uh, bully comes and steals your lunch money every day and you do nothing, they're going to keep stealing your lunch money, right? Um, deterrence doesn't work if you don't actually show some kind of cost for what someone's doing. Um, I think drones is another interesting one where, you know, a couple years ago as we saw drones begin to proliferate, there was kind of this question of, um, well, how would people treat attacks on drones? That's not what the Soleimani thing was in any case. That was different. I mean, you killed a, you just killed a senior uh, military commander in Iran, and you saw Iran respond with force and kind. Um, you know whether Iran considers the issue resolved or not. I think we shall see. You know, uh, I, I I don't know. Um, uh, that's a that's a, a, a challenging issue. Uh, but certainly we've seen now attacks on drones. There was an incident uh, last year where the Iranians shot down a U.S. Global Hawk in the Persian Gulf. And by and large, we've seen countries kind of shrug these off, actually. That if we've seen a number of instances where countries shoot down someone else's drone, and it is seen clearly as not as escalatory as shooting down an aircraft that has people on board that has human costs. Um, and one of the concerns that, that strategists might have with this kind of creation of a new rung in the escalatory ladder, if you will, is that it begins to lead to responses that sort of um, walk people up, right? Um, and I think one of the things that we've seen in this case is that that doesn't happen with attacks on drones, at least not yet, um, that it's, it's, uh, it's something that sort of at least stops at that, at that level. It hasn't, it hasn't, these incidents so far have not escalated to attacks on people yet. Uh, yes? I think he was part of oh, all right, um, fine, fair uh, enough. <clears throat> uh, I know a huge issue right now is dealing with the algorithms of drones because, like, uh, I have cousins that work with AIs, and they're saying that the el currently they have most of the algorithms pretty well set out, but they're trying to, like, improve them, and, like, the main issue right now is, like, how quickly can these algorithms learn and how quickly can they take in information. Um, do you think that the algorithms are make are a huge issue right now or do you think it's going to be like other problems outside of like the the technology behind it yeah so so current drones are largely remotely controlled um but the military is working on incorporating more uh, sophisticated ai machine learning tools particularly for information processing um so the flight controls are like fairly straightforward and automated um so if you have like a drone today and it loses communications. Um, it'll, you know, it would go to like a predetermined waypoint and just kind of fly a fly a circle and wait for somebody else to connect to it. A more advanced one, like a Global Hawk, is capable of landing itself autonomously um, if if need be. But by and large, like they're they're fairly simple in that respect. In fact, you could go buy a like a DJI, you know, quadcopter, and it's got more autonomy in it than an Air Force Reaper drone today. Now the Reaper's bigger. Uh, and has longer range and payload, it costs a lot more. But the autonomy is actually probably more advanced on commercial drones. In fact, I, have, I didn't bring it with me. I've got a, uh, a little drone I carry around sometimes for presentations um, that was like a stocking stuffer I got that's like 20 bucks uh, that can autonomously avoid obstacles. So you could put it in a room like this, and it's not great at it, but it'll like, you know, if you, it would avoid, it would attempt to avoid bouncing off the wall or people. Um, so there's a, uh, 
you know, where people are really interested is in the technology to process data that's coming off of these systems. Um, so the military is flying these drones all the time. They're, they're streaming high definition, full motion video back. They already have really more video feeds than they could possibly process and monitor. Hundreds of thousands of hours of video per year. And so um, if you've heard of, for example, Project Maven, it's a Defense Department project to use AI and machine learning. Um, it's, it's interested in processing the video feeds. It's actually not doing the flight controls. Um, and that's sort of some of the things that in the near term that the DOD is really interested in is just like how do we do better processing of all the information that we're collecting and find ways to use it more effectively. Uh, I have two questions related to regulations. So one of them is when autonomous weapon system is guided but it can also be misguided by let's say enemy. Yes. So it's kind of like hacking, and it can be used against yourself. Yeah. That, that one of the thing. The second thing is that the collection, access, and uses of data you just mentioned about autonomous weapon system in the future, if we can ex expect that it can improve itself by collecting the data and making decisions by itself. What is the ethical and moral thing of having human information and data and making decisions uh, attacking things. What are the conversations are around these regulations? Yeah. Um, so I think the first one in terms of like hacking or manipulation by adversaries, that's a really important dimension of this problem that doesn't exist in all of the civilian applications. Now in some it does, like in stock trading, that's very much a thing um, that people have, have actually been involved in spoofing and manipulating algorithms. That was actually part of, it was at least a contributing factor to um, the, fly, the big flash crash back in 2010. Uh, there was a London administrator who was spoofing algorithms and tricking them. Um, so that's something that certainly is, is very prevalent in adversarial environments that you don't necessarily get in like self-driving cars. Um, you might have people trying to sort of cheat a self-driving car to like get ahead of it at a stop sign or cut it off, but you're generally not going to people that want to get hit by the car, right? Um, and that's that's not the case here, and that's a big problem for militaries when they think about adapting this or adopting this technology. Is they've got to think about what's the enemy going to do, what's its vulnerabilities uh, of this technology, and then I think is is one of the biggest really. Um, pulls of restraint on militaries, the things that's holding them back, is this fear of what happens if someone hacks into it, right? Uh, what, what happens then? Um, because, you know, if, look, if you hack your communications network today and you send out some order, the enemy gets, a whole, gets on the radio and sends out an order like, attack all friendly forces, no one's going to follow that. The, like, the human will be like, oh, they hacked our radio. Let's switch to the alternate channel. Right, the robot doesn't know any better. Like it's like okay, right? So that is like a that's a very real problem. Um, then when you think about it in this context, in the other sense of, um, I'm sorry, I slipped my mind. What was the second? Is the, the data collection? The data collection. Like oh, and it's learning. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Militaries are going to want to have systems in place where they can collect data and they can update their technology very, very quickly. So once you get on the battlefield, you know. Um, if there's, a, there's a competition in innovation and counter-innovation. It's absolutely critical uh, as a war progresses. And if the war lasts any more than just a few days, you know, uh, who can actually out-innovate the other faster may be the biggest determining factor of who, who wins. That's going to matter quite a bit. So militaries are going to find ways to do that. And for machine learning, find ways to like soak up information, train new machine learning models, and deploy them very quickly. I think that learning process is still largely going to be one that has humans in the loop, if you will, of the learning process. Even if the actual system itself is autonomous when it's operating out there, it will largely be fixed in place. It will operate according to a fixed set of parameters. And then the humans might be sort of updating it tomorrow uh, based on, you know, um, new information that's come in, and they're going to want to do this as quickly as they can. But the idea of what you would technically call like online machine learning, where it's learning in real time in the environment, I think you'll find in this environment, uh, people are just very uncomfortable with that. Uh, you might have that, you might, you know, have that in cyberspace, with things like maybe spam filters or other things, uh, but I, I don't think in the physical battle space. I think it's very unlikely. Uh, yes.
Oh, I'm sorry. You had you had your hand up earlier. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm kind of going back a little bit. Um, but when we were talking about like uh, policy making on uh, you know sort of the rules of war, um, you you mentioned that you know certain bans on weaponry, like for landmines, for example, were successful, uh, whereas uh, other ones like ban bans on uh, aerial weaponry uh, uh, and stuff like that were less so. What, in your opinion, makes a certain policy effective or not effective in that regard? That is exactly the right question to be asking, right? That, I mean, that's sometimes we get lost in this. Is like we have these historical examples. Why does some succeed and some fail? Um, there's a couple. Um, I would say, by and large, this is an understudied area of of examination. So, like, if if any, do we have any PhD students? And like now, someone decides they want to go on and do like a PhD in political science or history. This is like a good. This is actually a good PhD topic. Um, but this is. Um, when you look at these examples, there are at least 40 historical examples of successes and failures in this space. Um, there are some common kind of themes. So one is that um, there needs to be a clear one. I think you'd say that you'd see success depending on a couple factors. One is the relative balance between the horror of a weapon for some reason. It's indiscriminate. It causes uh, inhumane suffering to combatants. There could be a couple of number of reasons why people don't like that weapon. It's destabilizing the international security. There's something bad about it versus its military value, right? So if you look at, for example, why have we been largely successful um, in giving up chemical weapons among most civilized nations? There are some exceptions like Bashar al-Assad, but most countries have given up chemical weapons, but nuclear weapons not so successful. Well, nuclear weapons are just more useful uh, for a military standpoint. Um, in fact, when it comes to strategic deterrence, there's actually nothing that compares to them, right? So if you're a country like North Korea or Iran, like there are huge strategic incentives for you to try to get a hold of nuclear weapons. Um, whereas chemical weapons, like actually when you deploy them against a military that has chemical protective gear, I mean, they're not totally useless. They'll slow people down a little bit, but they're not like a decisive game-changing weapon. So Saddam Hussein had chemical weapons, uh, and if he had used them, against the US military during the invasion of Iraq, it would not have changed things significantly. It would have slowed US forces down a little bit, but the outcome of the war would not have, would not have changed in any way, shape, or form. Um, the US response might have changed significantly uh, in terms of what the US did afterwards. So, so this is, I think, one element of this. Another one is uh, there has to be some pretty clear dividing lines between what is in and what is out. It's much easier to reach an agreement with another party about what you're each going to not do if you can each agree on the clear line that you're deciding not to cross. In the outset of World War II, there were attempts to restrain war among European powers in two critical dimensions. One was aerial attacks on cities, and the other one was battlefield use of chemical weapons. So all of the major European powers had sort of they actually had formal agreements against both of these at the outset of the war, and they actually intended to restrain both of these things. So when Hitler ordered the bomb, the Luftwaffe, to bomb Britain, in his original order, he actually ordered them not to bomb British cities, only military targets. Now, why? It's not because Hitler was a good person, right? It was because he was afraid of the British military and the British Air Force bombing uh, German cities in response. Exactly, right? Mutual destruction, mutual restraint, right? So even in the midst of this intense war, there was this attempt to restrain it from crossing some line. Uh, now, they ended up stumbling across that line for aerial bombardment, not for battlefield use of chemical weapons, but all sides had tens of thousands of mustard gas stockpiled, and they didn't use them against each other. Again, not because they were uh, good citizens. The Germans were uh, gassing people in the Holocaust, but they... They didn't use them um, on the battlefield because they were afraid of others using chemical weapons against each other. So um, what was different about aerial bombardment is they were bombing military targets. Where are military targets located? Well, they're located in industrial areas near cities. So the restraint fell apart when one night a German bomber got lost over London by mistake and bombed central London. In response, Hitler... Um, I'm sorry, Churchill ordered the bombing of Berlin. And uh, after that, Hitler announced the launch of the London Blitz, 
right? And the glove basically came off. So here was a place where actually countries desired restraint, but because the line wasn't sharp enough, they sort of stumbled their way across it. Um, so those are factors. The number of, of actors that you need to engage in restraint is another factor. It's needless to say easier to get everyone on board when there's a smaller number of actors who have access to the technology. Um, so these are a couple sort of factors, and there are other ones as well, um, that make a difference. Certainly path dependency can be one of them. Uh, if a prohibited weapon is like uh, something else that's been prohibited, it's sometimes easier to then pass new prohibitions against it. Um, but those are some of the factors. This sort of pessimistic conclusion, unfortunately, is when you look at those factors, they suggest that restraint is going to be very hard with autonomous weapons. Uh, that the lines aren't very clear. It's pretty widely proliferated. They are at least perceived to be of high value, whether they are or not. Who knows? Uh, but militaries see them as sort of game changing. There's debate about how terrible they are. You have some people saying they'd be awful. You have others saying, like, they'd be great. They'd be very precise. Self-driving cars could reduce, um, you know, people being hit by cars, we could do the same in war with autonomous weapons. Uh, so I think that's not, not clear. I think we ran out of time, so let's thank uh, our speaker. Okay. Thank you.